If gardening is your passion, digging in the soil is your pleasure, and growing your own food is your mission, we've got a lot in common. Get access to the greatest gardening minds, including yours truly, with The Gardener magazine. Filled with the latest gardening trends, inspirational ideas and tips. Available from leading retailers or online at thegardener.co.za. From cover to cover, it's gardening at its best. The Gardener Masterclass is proudly brought to you by Stark Airs, the foremost African commercial and home gardening specialist of globally sold premium seed and innovative gardening solutions, growing together for a sustainable future. And the Gardener and Detainee magazines. Get access to the greatest gardening minds, latest gardening trends, inspirational ideas and tips. just blending into the foliage. <laughs> okay, so I'm wearing my new shirt today. Can you see I'm, I'm in theme? And if I really want to hide away from you, I just need to go and like tuck myself in. Come Mason, come in. You see, I'm going to just tuck myself in behind one of these over here. And then I'll hide. Okay, anyway, yeah. Uh, shenanigans, shenanigans. Good morning, everybody. It's so lovely to be with you. Um, it's a crisp Thursday morning. Have you seen the snow report, guys? I thought that was the desert part of South Africa they were talking about. It's just like, it's all over. So make sure the wood is stocked up. Make sure you got the marshmallows. Uh, remember, keep the indoor plants slightly away from the fire. Um, and oh, just on a point of that, remember, fires dry out the air. So you're going to need to be doing a bit of extra spritzing if you're going to have the heaters and fans, those, those warming fans and stuff going. But anyway, guys, um, uh, and completely off topic, have you seen the aloes? Oh, guys, I actually, I was driving somewhere, actually I know exactly where it is because I want to get the seeds of the aloe, don't, 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 don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. But there was a, a, a ferox growing on the side of the road, like just a normal ferox, that's the big guy, like the candelabra one, okay, and it's got the most beautiful two-tone, like, like incredible, and I was driving and I was like, you know one of those, like, uh, like oh, there's a car in front of you, uh, the aloes are looking spectacular, um, guys, so absorb it, revel in them, um, if you can, just stop for a moment and see how the birds are enjoying them, and if you go really close up, you'll hear the buzz of bees as soon as the sun has broken. Um, they are there, they are like so happening. They, they're like, they're busy, they're busy, they're doing what they think, but the noise, it's just, it's a bzzz, you, you just hear it. And they're not gonna come and sting you, they've got better things to do, really. Um, today we have got a big topic guys and it's a hot topic and it's on the tip of everyone's tongues and it really started before covid bc <laughs> did we ever think we'd be using that bc it kind of the whole trend started before covid the whole downsizing people living in small homes wanting to connect with nature wellness you know these words they've all been used um uh healing, connecting with nature, all of those words that we hear so often uh, have really sparked the plant and the house plant revolution. Um, indoor plants is a bit, it's a bit impersonal, I think. House plant, they're for your house, they're for your home. They're for you. I mean, for goodness sake, we even give them names. And we, like, we, we go as far as almost like giving them mouth to mouth to keep them alive. Um, because we, 
we form relationships with these plants. Whether you want to admit it or not, we do. Uh, and, and then I love, I mean, that ticks all my boxes. It, it, it really resonates with me because that's how I feel about most plants. Um, so the fact that we found something, and most importantly, that the young uns love, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, the millennials, the, the X's, the Y's, or oh, I believe I'm a Z. I'm so far down the line now. <laughs> anyway, so private joke. <laughs> Guys, the, the, um, they're also known as housemates, you know, plant mates, housemates, because they keep us company. They do. They keep us company. If you're living alone in a bachelor flat uh, and you want something to come home to, and if it's not a dog or a cat, it's a plant. And yes, we talk to them. Gosh, our grannies used to talk to them and we'd think they were off there like Kalulus. Um, But we do the same. And I just, it makes my heart beat. So, so full. Um, folks, we've got a lot to get through today, and um, but before we do, uh, let's see who is here. Um, good morning, Ellen, good morning from Franchuk. Oh, Franchuk, beautiful. Ooh, Yo, but gosh, you guys have had rain, hey? Man, you have had rain, so uh, yeah, it, it are coming. Uh, Maureen, good morning, good morning, Lisa, good morning, Lisa McKenzie. Oh, mwah, 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 mwah. Chicken pa, sending you love. Big, big squeeze, big, big hug. And I'm still looking for that plant that you want. I will find it. Um, Marlene, good morning from a cold pine town. Yep. And do you know why the ground is so cold, guys? The ground is cold. I was gardening the other evening. It was like hoppers five. Um, it was nearly dark. I needed, nearly needed to put my headlamp on, my fishing lamp. But the cold comes up from the ground and it just like, you can almost, if it was like one of those movies where you're about to get nuked, it's like you can almost see the cold coming up because the ground is so wet. Because we've had over and above average rainfall, which is brilliant. Um, it really is good, but that's why it is so cold. Beryl, good morning from a breezy, oh, it's only breezy P-E, P-E. Um, good morning, Cindy May. Terry Lee, good morning, chicken pa. Um, Renata, good morning. Kerry Graham, um, ah, it's good to see you guys here. Um, who else do I have on here? I am right, 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 right. Beryl, good morning, good morning, good morning. Guys, there are loads of you, whether you are on Facebook or whether you are on YouTube. Um, Steph, good morning. Barbara, Barbara, ah, ma, ma, I'm coming to Cape Town. I'm coming to Cape Town soon. You know, Barbara, um, <laughs> everybody in my team knows Barbara. Um, well, they don't know her. They, they know her. But uh, when I do a talk, whether I'm at a builder's or whether I'm at a garden centre, um, Bob's is there. And she's in the front row and she's normally got some knitting with her sometimes but she's always got a little something. And that little something is wrapped in the perfect little bit of um, uh, tin foil um, or sometimes wax wrap. And in there is a yummy, like a little samosa um, or one of those little coconut fingers. Um, what did Bob's give me the last time? It was, it was something, it, you, you, she knit, you knitted something. It was the little, the tea towels. The tea towels, you did me the tea towels. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're a legend. You're an absolute legend. And it's like, it, yeah, I know you, but you know me better. <laughs> um, Nox, good morning. Nokatula, shele, shela. Good morning. Pindile, ndaba. Good morning. Uh, my Rolex. Good morning, Team Rolex. Good morning. Huh. I might need the, your, those gadgets of yours because, um, yeah, you see, I've got a bit of a, a mace. Can you see this, uh, this green stuff here? Um, this fake turf. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've got something coming for you. So, uh, yeah, on how to clean this. 
Interesting. How's it, guys? How's it? Yeah, I want to I wanna take that thing and give it a good run. You know, I want to be like Speedy Gonzalez with it. But I can't tell you any more, guys, because it's like early days. Okay, early days. Uh, Susan, good morning. Susan Spook Ferreira. <laughs> I love that. Spook. So Spook Awesome. Do you know what Spook Awesome is? Candy floss. Candy floss. Spook Awesome. Isn't it a lovely word? Afrikaans. Beautiful word. Um, mm. Who else do we have here? Yavashni, good morning. Marina, um, guys, you're here. So let's get going. Let's get going. First of all, let's just make one fact very, very clear. And that is that indoor plants were not bred by human beings like us to indulge us for our homes. Let's just get that fact out the way. The fact is that indoor plants or house plants or housemates actually originated from the jungles. Way back, way, way back, the plant hunters that went out and risked their lives to go out there and get the right plants and find new species from the 1800s, even before. And remember, it wasn't like just jump on a plane on fly safe air or lift and sure, I'm just popping up. Okay, this was like nine months on a ship full of rats and scurvy and whoa, whoa, I mean, whack, whack. there's no, no fresh veg there, huh? Um, they, seriously, it was epic. People lost their lives. They, it was all in search of the new plants. I mean, can you, I would have loved to have been a plant hunter. I probably would never have come back because I would have joined a tribe, you know, Actually, yes, I can see this. I would have had a bow and arrow and I would be a hunter-gatherer because uh, that's my other name, actually. Um, through a group of friends, when we go away on, on holiday, I'm the hunter-gatherer. That's my job. You know, if we need this, if we need that, if we need that, I go. Um, so I probably would have loved that, actually, maybe. Okay, let's not go there. I'm talking nonsense now. Sorry. Um, 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 my brain is there. I'm in the, I'm in the jungle in South America. I now have war paint on. Um, I am there. I am there. I don't know about the loincloth, but I'm there. <laughs> okay. So, history. History of plants. Um, and you know, it's like family history. We always, we've always got to remember from whence we came. From whence we came. Who our mom and dad was. Our grandparents. What is the lineage? Um, you know, because we learn things. We learn things through this. We learn that Uncle Cecil at 64 had a bit of a cholesterol issue. Okay? So then we like, we, we become aware that it's a genetic thing. So we need to like, okay, be careful. You know, not so much deep fried food. Um, and likewise, the same with plants. If we know from whence they came, where they originate, we learn more about them. Yes. Okay, you got it. And if you know that auntie whoever, you know, had a twitch, well, then you're going to seriously check out the gene pool, you know, and diversify. Mm. Okay, never mind. Okay, I got my coffee. It's delicious. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about big groups of plants, big, big groups. And what we've done today is... We, we've grouped them so that you can get an idea of what is out there and, and what might work for you. Okay, now if you are a houseplant murderer and have been seen on police file, it's okay. Because by the end of today's lesson, I'm hoping that you're going to have a few more answers. But guys, we all do it. I've killed an indoor plant. I've killed a few. Yeah, it happens. So don't beat yourself up, you know, just dust it off and we learn and that's how it goes. So spathophyllums, let's talk about this. <sighs> Spathophyllum sensation. And I get why it's called sensation. Um, from the tropical jungles um, of the Americas, uh, in in the jungle, they can get up to two meters tall, two meters, with these beautiful, graceful leaves. 
Uh, we've got one on the veranda, and listen, guys, the veranda is like the wind, all the weather comes straight up the valley, poof, onto the veranda. So you can see, you know, it, it's 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 been torn a bit. You know, this is when we have really heavy winds, um, and it has scarred a bit. But she's fine. She's absolutely happy. Um, sensation, beautiful. And now we all know the other spathophyllum, which is also known as the peace lily. Um, the peace lily is its affectionate name. In terms of lighting, it's medium light, even to dark light. Now, let's just talk about light quickly, because when we talk about light, we say, uh, when you go and buy a plant, it needs medium light. Well, what does that mean? Do you know? Well, what are we talking about? Dark light. Use the plant, look at the plant, and the plant will tell you what it actually needs. Large, broad leaves. Think about it. The engine of plants is within the leaves, the chlorophyll. If they are large and broad, it means it can cope in deeper shade or in lower light. Okay. Thinner, narrower, with color. Okay. Come along here. I'm going to show you a prime example. Um, Mason, you're going to have to wiggle yourself around here. Prime example is one of these guys. Okay, the, this is one of the, the little Dracaenas, I think it is, yes, Marginata. A lot of coloration, very little chlorophyll, very little chlorophyll, green. So that's going to tell you it needs bright light, it needs a lot of bright light. If you had to put this in low light, automatically what's going to happen is its leaves are going to become broader, broader. The red will start disappearing and the green will become more dominant as a point of survival because it needs more chlorophyll, it needs the engine room okay, to be able to make it work. Um, and I hope that makes sense. So narrower leaves, brighter light. And when we talk about light, we're not talking about direct sun guys, we're talking light, filtered light that comes through. So if the sun is up here, you've got a window and it's that beautiful light that comes through. That's what we're talking about, light. Okay, a couple of general rules. Home plants, house plants, housemates, not in front of an air con. No. Front doors, where there's a draft. No, they don't like that. Okay, um, those are the kind of practical things that you need to think of. All right, let's go over here. Ferns. Oh, this isn't it. <laughs> Isn't this beautiful? I mean, look at that foliage. That's from under the sea. It looks like, looks like coral. It's spectacular. This is, or it has to be one of my favorite, favorite ferns. Um, there's a whole lot of, uh, let's put it this way. It's a hot potato ferns. Um, currently, there are lists and lists and lists and lists about that probably 99% of them have been declared alien invasives. Um, but I, uh, I'm i choosing to take the fifth on this one and, and not share any more. So as long as you can find them in a garden centre, buy them. Uh, that's my ruling. Um, and I, I said nothing, 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 nothing. This guy has got a beautiful name. It's called Phlebodium. Um, actually, it sounds like phleblo, Phlebodium, but nice word to say. Uh, easy to grow. We've even got some growing in the, in the shade garden, um, as long as you're in a frost-free area. Um, remember, guys, in terms of ferns, that upright one that grows in a little crack this big um, with those little nodules, that's the sword fern, upright. That is a negative no, 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 no. No. That thing multiplies like like fleas, um, and, and that is a, the sword fern is a, is a big no-no, so please, not that. However, this guy here is a relative of it, but it's called the Boston fern. Look at this beautiful yellow foliage, golden. <gasps> the secret with ferns, and oh my goodness, the maiden hair, oh caramba, how many of these have you guys killed? <laughs> so the secret with the maiden hair is water, because and the maiden hair, indigenous to South Africa, um, you can actually eat the fronds. 
if you really want to. Um, but what it needs is constant moisture because where you see them growing in the wild, and I'm taking you back from whence it came. When you're doing your walk, your weekend retreat, and you're in the Drakensberg or you're wherever, 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 and you're walking and you see these lovely ferns, where are they normally growing? Next to a stream, okay, on the side of a mountain where it's protected, where there's a bit of water coming down the rocks. That's where you see them, constant moisture. When we notice that it needs water, and the other thing is, this fern does not droop. <laughs> The only time you need water, you know it needs water, is when you go to it and you grab the leaves and they go like a crinkle cut chip. <coughs> okay, too late, she cried. Too late. So a good way to deal with these maiden hairs is to just put it on a tray with some pebbles and a little bit of water in there because then as the plant needs it. So it'll just have that little constant maintenance or or maintains the water. That's not, you're not drowning it. You're not drowning it. You're putting it on a tray with some pebbles and that also helps with the humidity because that's what they need, okay? And it's that supply of water. So maiden hairs, there's only one secret. Water, 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 okay? Right, would you believe that this beautiful plant, would you believe <laughs> that it's actually part of the hen and chick family. You know those green and white common things that grow all over the hen and chicks? This is a chlorophytum, but look at that color. Who thought, who would have thought? Look at that beautiful orange, orangey peach. Um, very in vogue, guys. If you can get your hands on one of these, I actually don't know its botanic, its, its species name. It is chlorophytum princess Mabel. Ooh. Mabel. They could have found a better word. Anyway, a better. Anyway, I've got a Princess Delilah or something, or Princess Nunu. I don't know. Anyway, but Princess Mabel. Um, I'll just call it Chlorophytum for now. Okay, makes me feel better. Um, but can you believe it? This is this is part of the hen and chick family, and we know how easy they are to grow. We know that. We know that they can go for long periods without water. Okay, we also know that they can grow in quite waterlogged areas. So you're looking at a plant that's quite diverse and tough. Yep, okay, now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. Color, guys, I'm not gonna spend too much time on color, but in terms of, of what is available there, and there are many, many plants, but the, the success rate of taking a beautiful begonia like this, I mean, look at that, isn't that spectacular? Of a beautiful tuberous begonia like this and keeping it alive and then transplanting it out into the garden, a success rate, I'm, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna say 50%. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna say 50% and nothing more. Um, it's, it, it, they tough. Uh, they're tough customers to, to look after. And uh, the main reason why is because we water them too much. And you'll actually see, if you look in here, look inside there, the tuber is actually planted in another little pot. Okay, and that just gives it a bit of security. It helps it because it's very brittle. Look, I mean, this guy's wonky woo-woo. Look at him. Okay, they, they break easily. They're quite delicate. Um, do not overwater them because that's why begonias die because we're overwatering them. Um, and that generally goes for most color indoors. Anthurium adrianum, ah, spectacular, um, absolutely spectacular. And you see what's happening here now on the spathe? You see what's happening there? It's actually going to start forming seeds. Okay, in my head, we're really not interested in the seeds. We wanted to make more flowers. So what I do when I see something like this, I go, I follow it down because they are quite brittle. So I follow it all the way down. I don't know if you're in there, if you can see that. I put my thumb on top of it, on top of it, and then I just do that, okay? And then it snaps off. Easiest way. 
Um, you don't want to go pruning it and be leaving stalks over there because that makes trouble for later. Um, but my mom used to actually um, grow her anthuriums from seeds and we'd wait till these would get um, nice and puffy and they would get these little yellow seeds which we could just break off almost like a pomegranate. That's the kind of size that they would get to. And then we'd sow the seeds of anthuriums. Um, but yeah, if you really want it, you can do that. All right, ficus. Ah, beautiful figs. Lovely, lovely ficus. So many different types, whether it's the Benjamina, which is this guy, whether it's the starlight, which is the variegated guy. And of course, what did I tell you a bit earlier? Chlorophyll. Okay, so a lot of green in here, which means that starlight can cope with a little less light than something like this guy. It, okay, it, is that making sense to you? Ficus originate from, from India. Um, they're sacred. They are revered. The fruit is eaten by many, many um, animals, insects, bats, and it's a great indoor house plant especially if you're wanting something quite dramatic okay that's going to grow quite quickly remember all figs because it's a fig it's part of the fig family all figs will produce a latex there it comes a bit of a latex when you're working with it that's the the, the sap all right now that sap depending on how allergic you are can cause a bit of skin irritation um, and it's quite sticky and of course, the rubber tree is where our forefathers, when they attacked and went into the countries all east and decided that rubber was a way to go. Um, in the word, in, in the uh, seek of and seeking progression and, and modernization, where thousands and millions of hectares of indigenous forest was cut down for rubber and it's still happening today sad but anyway okay guys right oh and the other rubber elastica oh guys whatever you do do not let this plant escape okay and i say this with all due respect um it's got a bit of uh, this can just be wiped off oh and when it comes to cleaning cleaning your leaves there are many things that you can use guys but one of the easiest, most practical ways is a bit of milk diluted into water with one of those soft microfiber cloths. You know those microfiber cloths? Yeah. Use that to wipe the leaves. Okay. Um, because plants get, they get dirty. I mean, have a look here. It, it's, there's dust on here. All right. I'm sure I actually had a cloth here somewhere. Um, I don't have a microfiber cloth, but I'm going to show you very very quickly this is a bit of mutton cloth and it'll also do the job just as well um, but it's important that we give our plants a bit of a spa day and here is there we go that's all we need and look at the dust that's coming off um, so give them a bit of a wipe it's really important and um, because hey, look at all that dust caramba mm, clearly i haven't given them enough of a spa day mm. okay so this is ficus elastica. Guys, you have seen the potential of this plant. This plant is like a young 13-year-old, 14, 15-year-old male who is eating you out of house and home. Loaves of bread disappears, eggs disappear. Uh, the cereal box goes empty overnight. And you're like, what is going on here? If you let this plant loose, that's what's going to happen. In nature, Ficus elastica will get to 30, 40 meters in height. Do you see these roots? Look, look, it's like a triffid. It's looking for somewhere to go. It's looking. And I'm actually going to do this. Um, I wasn't planning on doing it, but I am going to do it. Um, I want to take, um, yes, no, wait, two seconds. If you want to take it out, guys, these roots are vicious, hey? Seriously vicious. In fact, just yesterday, I had somebody send us an email um, saying, um, 
Nothing's growing underneath this plant. I think my neighbor has killed the plants in the bed. I'm like, how do you know? She says, I saw her walking with a bottle. I'm like, guys, you can't start accusing people of killing plants. Because the plants on the other side of the bed are growing fine. I ask for a picture, I ask for a wide picture, they send me a picture. What is growing in the bed? Specimen A. Look at the roots. These roots will take you out like in those horror movies and take any other plant out, wrap themselves around it and strangle it. Okay, so best keep them just as house plants. Don't tell your children these stories because they will have nightmares about this fig. Um, but spectacular, in my opinion, for a great house plant. Um, very tough. In fact, most people kill them through overwatering. Let it dry out. Okay, let it dry out well and then give it a good watering. Um, and ficus elastica also, if, you know, if no, just, just don't, just. beautiful colors. You get a lovely golden, you get a beautiful cream which is called Tinica, lovely name, better than Mabel there, whatever it was called. Okay, so that's Ficus Elastica. All right, so those are your figs. Um, come along this way and let's show you another group. Calatheas or Marantas. Calatheas or Marantas, oh, they are beautiful guys. Um, also become very, very big in the plant world, especially in the collecting world. Could you believe that this sexy beast is a Calathea? Um, Calatheas originate from the jungles of South America. Um, they need very little sunlight, very, very little sunlight. And they also are known as the shadow plant. Why are they known as the shadow plant? Because guys, all day and every day. We don't see it happening. The leaves turn to look for the light. They turn like this. Somewhere on YouTube there's a, a video of someone who did it in slow-mo and it, it's fascinating to see how the leaves move all day looking for the optimum light. Absolutely spectacular. Now they're coming from the jungle, they jungle floor plants, which means what are they going to need? Rich soil, lots of organic matter, okay? And they are tough because on the floor of the jungle is where the war starts. Because if you're a little seedling, you have got to fight things that eat you, things that will stomp on you, and other plants that might take you out. So, in terms of toughness, very, very tough. Okay, orchids. Oh, caramba. We're not going to go into this in a big way because we have done many, many videos. And if you want to know more about how to look after your orchids, please, guys, just go to Garden Tube, which is our YouTube channel, and type in orchids. And whether it's a calathea like this. Oh, I mean, come on, look at that. Isn't it beautiful? That is, that is spectacular. Calatheas, Catalea, um, or whether it is a Cymbidium. Look at that. Now the Cymbidiums, do you see that? Do you see that neck there? It's got a movable part at the base so that it can do that because there is where the pollen sits in there. Okay, so I want to show you this here. Let me get in there. So when it is pollinated, the insect will get in there, okay? And as it goes in, that is what it want, wants to pick out, and that gets stuck to, okay? They get stuck to the top of it. Um, because there are the stamens, which is where all the pollen sits, and it actually collects that and then transports it and then re fertilizes or repollinates the next one that it goes to. Quite fascinating, but the arch is here for maneuverability for whatever size insect is going to go in there in order to pollinate it. Quite fascinating. These are winter flowering, so if you've got some now, they should be looking spectacular. And remember, it's also a great garden plant. Yeah, but 
Yes, because they actually grow in the wild. Damn. Okay. So these guys, brilliant. You can plant them in semi-shade. Um, they actually enjoy quite a bit of light. Um, how do we know that? How do we know they need quite a bit of light? Because of the narrow leaves. Okay. All right. Got it. This is the other spathy that we spoke about earlier, the other peace lily. All right. And you can see these flower about twice a year. Um, of course, we always buy them when they're in flower, and then we wonder why they're never flowering again after that. That is because of light and food. All right. Uh, if they're not flowering, remember, you don't have to flower if you're kind of really comfortable or you, you're lacking in some things. So it's light that they need in order to make them flower. Um, right, guys, let's talk philodendrons. Now, <sighs> philodendrons, philodendron, where else are we? There was philodendron on that side. They are all incredible. It's a huge, huge family of plants. Um, a huge genus and in fact so big that they were there are over 489 species okay of the philodendron that is listed 489 no wonder why everybody wants one um, it was discovered way way back um, in the early 1800s also brought from the Central Americas and the word philodendron, and in fact, it's, it's a, quite a weird thing because most of us don't know the, the botanical name of a plant, okay? We're, but we'll call it by its common name, like um, the peace lily, but we don't know that it's called spathophyllum. Um, but philodendron is one of those few plants that we actually, that's the way we know it. Like, we don't call it a vacuum cleaner, we call it a hoover. Isn't it weird? You know, uh, yeah, it's kind of weird. But philodendron is one of those, and it comes from the Greek word, which philo, philo means love, and dendron is tree, because it can become tree-like, and it grows. Some of them grow on trees. You've seen them. They're huge. Um, very easy to take care of. Many, many different species. And, in fact, these guys, when they flower, you know that they make that spade. Okay, that, that, like that I showed you with the Arum lily. They're part of, of the Aracea family, which also um, the Anthurium is part of. Which also is part of this is the Arum lily. Oh, okay, now I get it. So do you see from whence it came? Um, so they make that spathe, but do you know what they do? They so philodendrons, whether it's this big guy or whether it's this one, which is the Scandens, which is great for up high trailing. When they flower, they, the, the flowers produce a pheromone. What is a pheromone? It's like Old Spice or Ox, pulls the chicks or the men, okay? So a pheromone, which attracts, okay, let's change this to um, uh, eau de toilette, or what are they called? Give me a name of a chick's perfume. Um, CK1, or Chanel number no. five. Kev, you clearly like Chanel number no. five, right. So they produce a pheromone, which basically smells like Chanel, fun, uh, not Funda five, uh, Chanel number no. five, or CK1. <laughs> and the beetle that is needed to pollinate this thinks, guys, there's a whole lot of chicks in this plant. Let's go party here. And they go and they go to the spade and that's how they pollinate it. The plant is so smart that it makes the pheromones. Fabulous. I mean, like, how does that happen? Yeah, our nature is incredible. Okay, this group of plants. Okay, guys, many of you, and if you were given one, if you bought one, I know it'll still be alive. Why? Because they're really hard to kill. So if you were a beginner, um, new newbie, plant parent, um, this is the guy to go for. I personally love them. They've got a terrible uh, common name, which is called mother-in-law's tongue. I mean, come on, guys. Yeah, I get it. I get it. 
but they've recently changed their name. They're now called Dracaenas. So the plant people did a whole lot of studying and decided that they really should be called Dracaenas and not um, Sansevieria. There are about 70 species of Sansevieria, which come from Kenya, um, um, from Afro right into South Africa, and they are truly incredible. Um, they are generally tall, upright, but some of the new cultivars are spectacular colours, which I love. They have got quite a vicious root system, but does that mean that they, if I put them out, they're going to like take out the, um, the, the, the lines to the septic tank or something? No, they're not. Um, but you can see what it's done. Look what, look what this guy's done to, to the pot. This flower pot used to be round. It's now an oval. Um, and they are, they, they are aggressive, hey? I mean, look at that. Look at the size of that root. But look at those healthy root fibers. Uh, a great plant, a uh, very, very amazing plant. Why? Because this is one of the plants that NASA studied. And they studied a whole lot of different plants in terms of air purifying, because that's what we all want to know. You know, like, how do we get clean air? How do we get clean air? Well, the bottom line is that if you've got a 100 square meter apartment, um, according to NASA, you need nine of these, nine in order to purify the air. What do they do? They take out all the bad things, um, all the things that begin with chlor. They take all of those out, chlorides and all of those. They take it out the air, they purify it so that we can get clean air. But these guys, you can't kill. Um, and some of them even from the Congo. And I met a guy who had every one of the species. When I'm big. One day when I'm big. Um, yeah, so that's, that is the, the Sansevieria, quite spectacular. Okay, um, uh, last two, one, two, last two ones, last two that I want to chat to you about is the one is the Trachycarpus. Now, Trachycarpus, guys, is kind of like an old-fashioned fern. Um, uh, it's actually a palm. When you go into those um, beautiful, fancy hotels, if you've ever gone across to, um, uh, to, uh, Thailand, you will see these. It's also known as the Chinese windmill plant, and I get why it's called that. But what I want to do is, um, I just want to take this off. So Trachycarpus, there it is, actually comes from China, grows outdoors. Come along with me here to the table, and I want to show you a few things. So so this plant was was discovered, and it's, it's a brilliant house plant, guys. Um, in terms of, of a palm. It's brilliant. It can cope with low, low light, very little water, tough as nails. And I really think we need to grow more of these. But they are quite expensive. And why are they expensive? Because they are slow. Now, way back in the plant hunting time, like 1849, this guy called Robert Fortune, who was bumbling around um, uh, one of the forests, came across this plant. And so the plant was named after him, Trachycarpus fortunia. Yeah, Robert Fortune. Okay. But he then took a piece of this plant to Kew Gardens in London. And they thought, oh, this is great. We've discovered a new plant. But actually, the Chinese had been using it for hundreds of years before the Scottish lad came across it. And what do they use it for? They use it for its incredible strength. And in here, in these leaves, these leaves are what they call, have, they, they just have amazing strength. So whether you're drying the leaves, um, they can also make cloth, um, or whether they were using it as rope, this is what trachycarpus is used for. So if you had to do that, all right, and then, I'm pulling. <laughs> Strength. Okay. And I haven't even done anything to it. But what they would do, the Chinese, ancient Chinese, would then use the center rib, which is this. The center rib. And they would dry it. And then they would knock it about and, and use it for all sorts of things. But trachycarpus, as an indoor plant for me, is a number one. Um, really a number one. Okay. So, 
Oh, and then I've got to talk about this guy. Okay, have a look at him. I mean, this is this is a bird's nest fern. Can you believe it? It's a two-year-old kokodama. True story. It was made over two years ago. There it is. You can see even some of the, the, the fishing line that we used is now even coming apart. Notice how we feed it, and I'm going to show you that. And we let it just sit on this. But, yeah, fashions that come and go. Fashions that come and go. Shame. And it needs a bit of a, of a treatment over there. Right, guys, let's get, let's get moving. Remember that according to what you want, there are many different structures and feels of different plant whether it's modern, whether it's old-fashioned. So whether you're looking for something that is tall, that creates impact, you want to go with something like this, or the sensation, okay, which is over there, the big leaves. Whether it's soft and flowy, because that's the look you're wanting. That's what you want to go for. I've given you here so many different options, but there is an option for every nook, corner, cranny in your home. But those, that is what we ultimately want to aim for. Think of the space first, not the plant first. And, and I'm going to say that again. Think of the space first and then the plant. Because if we don't, we are going to end up bringing a plant home that we want to put down the passage right at the end, where it's quite dark, okay, and put a ficus there and say live. And it's going to do this in two weeks and all its leaves are going to fall off. Boof. Because it's not getting enough light. Okay. And then when the leaves fall off, <clears throat> we think, OMG, it needs more water. So we water it some more. And it's like glug, 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 glug. You're drowning it. You're killing it. When leaves fall off, guys, it is a sure tell, 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 tale sign that you are giving it too much water. Okay. Back off. We know you love them. We know you do. But don't kill it with kindness. Okay. Hot topic. Hot topic. And uh, for all the plant collectors, moms out there, Zamio, the ZZ plant. Uh, Zamios, wow, are they so popular? Well, I'll tell you one thing, number one, because it's got a bit of black in it. Like, oh, black leaves, serious. You want to see my ZZ? Only if you show me yours. <laughs> ZZs, hit the market, bang, everybody wants it. I mean, this guy is, how much is this ZZ? Oh, no price. Probably, probably, yeah, probably about 300 rand, I'd say. Why are they so expensive? Because they slow. ZZs come from East Africa, Kenya, right up to the tip of South Africa. They grow on the floor, in the jungles, okay? In the, the forests, okay? We know this. This is from, from, the, from where they were originally found. And you can see they've got these thick tubers. Thick, 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 thick. Um, in nature, they grow very upright because they're on the forest floor and they're looking for light. In nature, that's what it does. And you can see here, the way, um, sorry, it's the other way around. In nature, they're more sprawling because they're on the forest floor and they're sending their leaves out to be able to catch as little bit of sunlight that happens to come through as possible. What the growers do is they grow them in more light, which is why they're more upright. You can see that this guy, we've had him for quite a while. So it was upright, and now it's starting to do that, which means that we've placed it in lower light. As its botanical name is Zaminocaulis zaminocactus. Ask someone to say that uh, 17 times um, with uh, cheeks full of ma marshmallows, and it'll be quite a cool game. I didn't say drinking game, no. I just said game. All right. Now, sometimes your ZZs weep. And I've had people asking me this. They say, they're drops of water. Mm. Coming out the leaves. 
Guys, that is quite a normal thing for your ZZ. Because, <coughs> excuse me, your ZZ actually has a very tuberous root system. Um, and you can see it's got these thick, fleshy, fleshy um, stems. And it is like a water pump on steroids. So it pumps water and it feeds water from its roots up through those thick stems into the leaves. If your ZZ is incredibly happy, if it is happy and optimal, it will then, out of its little stomas, out of its pores, actually plop out little bits of water, little droplets. Quite fascinating. That's why they say sometimes my ZZ is crying. It actually means it's incredibly happy. So it's joy tears. Um, what the ZZ can also do, if you've been overfeeding it, or if it's got a mineral in the soil in excess, the ZZ has the amazing ability to take that mineral, put it through its system, and spit it out in the form of a droplet. And when that droplet dries, you will see like a white substance. That's the dried mineral that the plant takes and says, bloop, out you go. Isn't that fascinating? I just, plants are incredible. Absolutely incredible. Okay, guys, what we're going to do, think about display. Think about your pot covers. Think about your display. And I'm going to quickly go through this. But always bear in mind that the pot cover that you buy will come in to, um, will come back into fashion at some point. So don't stress about it. We have a box in the garage. It's one of these clear boxes. And, you know, as we buy the pot cover and we no longer want it, then what we do is we just swap them out. So pot covers from these, and remember, they don't have holes, so please be very careful, okay? They don't have holes. So your watering, I'm going to touch on in a minute of how to do it easily, okay, and efficiently. Whether it's the natural look like beautiful baskets, okay, um, or if it is a ceramic. There are so many different options that you can use. And it's about us finding the right fit for our homes. Um, and go looking. And if you cannot afford the three pots that you want this month, then don't buy them. Because I guarantee you that by next that if you bought the one, you could only afford one out of the three. By the next time you go there to the shop, they're all gone. And then you're sitting with one lonely pot that doesn't work with anything. So rather save up and then go and buy your collection of pots. Um, <clears throat> just to make and control your expectations, you know. Because when you go back and you wanted that one, I want that one that looks like this. Like this. And you say, oh. We only got in one container, now they're all gone. You're like, oh my word. It happens. In terms of soil, I've spoken to you about the different plants. Your basics that you're going to use, guys, is just a plain potting soil. All right, now there are different things that you can add to your potting soil, of course, because depending on the plant. Now remember, I said ficus, all right? Nice and airy. Calatheas grow on the forest floor, so they're needing some good drainage. Your philodendrons can grow almost anywhere. Your begonias, if you do save them and get them growing somewhere else, the biggest thing is about watering. Ferns need a lot of moisture, all right? Your ficus, your, your, this guy, okay, was all about drainage. So knowing these things, we then know what mix we need to use for what plant. So you have a standard potting soil, and then from there, you pimp it. So if it's a plant that needs a lot of moisture, we would take our potting soil and we would add in some beautiful palm peat. Because why? Because the palm peat holds the moisture. Very, very good when you're doing ferns, okay, or you are doing um, your palia, they also enjoy it, okay. 
um, they would be incredibly happy with that. So that's what we need to add. And there's something else what I want to find that you need to add. And that, so we would add palm peat if we're needing the moisture. We would probably, in terms of a bucket of soil, one bucket of soil, I would add at least five handfuls, at least. Conversely, if you've got plants that need good drainage and good air, if I've got one bucket of soil, I would add in perlite. Okay, perlite is soft. Um, it is great for adding in air and air particles, which means that it's going to drain well. So that's important that you can add some perlite into your mixture. How much? A bucket of soil, I would add no more than three to four large handfuls. You don't want too much perlite. Okay. Um, so that gives you kind of an indication. Those are the only two things, honestly, that I would add. Um, from your basic potting soil, I would use, of course, it's your palm peat and it's your perlite. Next, 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 next. Why is it dying? And what can I do? Okay. But before I get to a few exhibits there, I'm going to show you the quickest and easiest way to feed and water your plants. Now, we all know they need food. Why? Well, it's very simple, guys. They're in a pot. They can't go anywhere to get their food. And you will see when they need food. Um, they'll, their leaves will start going yellowish. They'll start dropping off. It's not going to be putting on new growth. It happens. Okay, so what do we do? This, this, this. Now, I told you I was going to uh, touch on it. Those little spiky things that you saw in there are these. So this is like, <laughs> this, is, this is really cheating, but I love it. Uh, we've got a couple of these packs. True story, under the kitchen sink. All right, under the bowl. And um, we take these little Starkey's Nutri Sticks. These are plant food sticks. And all we do is we take it and uh, let's just do this guy. Okay, it's really easy. Um, you just take the plant, wherever it is, and the instructions are on there, depending on the size of the plant. And you take your little Nutri Stick, okay? And this Kokodama, it really probably does need a transplant. And if you can see that there, and then you just push them in. Oh, the soil, jeez, this guy's great. Okay, and you push them in there. As you're watering it now, so the nutrients then release from the plant sticks. Okay, and that's going to give it all the nutrition that it needs. Nice and easy, depending on the size of the pot, and it's really nice and easy. You just go around with these little plant sticks, and uh, they remind me of... Um, Guys, they remind me of those little sweeties that you used to get as a kid. Um, I don't know if any of you remember them, but they remind me of, of those little sweeties. But all you do is you take it, look, and just push it in there. And that is as difficult or as easy as feeding is. Nice and simple, huh? Hmm. Okay. Aren't you looking gorgeous? Man, you're beautiful. Oh, okay, right. Feeding, guys, very simple. Feeding, uh, Tupperware, big bowl, bath, whatever, sink, um, five to ten grams, nutri feed. Got all the nutrition you are going to need. Ten grams into five liters of water. Boom, there it goes. That's it, okay? You've still got a whole bag left. Or you can dilute it into here. Now, when you, when you mix it, okay, some of the little granules will stay behind. Okay, don't stress yourself out. That's quite normal. Um, and this you can also use as a granular. So I could take it just like this on bigger plants, like Fred, the ficus. Okay, I could take it, and if that was Fred there, I would just sprinkle it around Fred, okay, around his main stem, and then give it a good watering. So you can do it either way, and you can do it every two weeks. Every two weeks. Okay, right. Get it in there. And then what we add, and this is like anything that has a cough, that has a snivel, sniffle, 
that's got um, like uh, like a twitch. Anything that's looking a bit off gets a bit of Calpac. And Calpac is like having, um, yeah, it's like having, what is it? Carenza, a tonic. There we go. It's a tonic. Okay, this is seaweed, organic seaweed. Give it a good shake. Um, the lid is your measurer. Ah, you're so clever. Look inside here. 10, 20, whatever. Basically, it's 10 mils per liter. So I've got five liters in here. So 20, 20. Uh, and you know what? You can never use too much. So I'll just add a bit more. Not of this because it is a liquid seaweed. Okay, it's not going to like make your plant grow another ear or something. Um, this is really good stuff because of the cytokinins that it's got and it's got all the nutrients and the minerals that are from the seaweed. And we all know how good it is. How do we water? You take it like this. You take the plant, you pop it in there. Step one. Step two. You need something. And I've got something very bad here, but I'm going to show you. I've got a little, little terracotta pot, and that's how you're going to water it. And as I'm watering it, I'm having a chat. How are you doing? Really? Your cousin did that? Married your first cousin? No. Imagine the children they're going to have. Oh, <gasps> You don't say. Oh! Pregnant at that age, and you have a chat with the plant. How are you doing? You know, it's okay. Yeah, no, have a good week. We have discussions. Most times, we actually just pour our hearts out to them. Not so much verbally, but we think it. Because <laughs> those are the quiet moments. And there's something so incredibly therapeutic about this. <laughs> it really is. And so you water it until the water drains from the bottom. Have a towel or a cloth. Pop it one side and that is watering. But all of this that's in here we have reused and we will reuse it and reuse it so that on whatever the day is that you choose that you're watering because most of these plants can average seven to ten days of watering. I pop my kokodama in, get a cup of tea, leave it there. Bigger plants obviously you can't really do this but you could certainly do them in the bath okay um, and that will do the trick just as easily but here I'm saving water. It's really good for the headspace. And the plants are smiling. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm going to leave this crocodile in here because he needs a little bit. What can go wrong? What can go wrong? Um, something can always go wrong, guys, um, and especially with your orchids. <laughs> the awkward orchid. Folks, with orchids, let's not complicate it. If it has got too big. If it has finished flowering and it needs to be repotted, okay, which is generally something that you'd want to do every two to three years, you're going to go to your local garden centre and you are going to ask for orchid potting mix. They have it. Orchid potting mix. That's what you want to use. And put it into a pot size, just one bigger. Not huge, just one bigger, all right? And you want to use these. They work, guys. This is for when you need them, okay? to be able to get the right nutrition for putting on growth. So in other words, after your cymbidium has flowered, after it is flowered, you then start feeding with this, which is going to give you the growth. Start coming three months before winter, before they start flowering, you start feeding with flowering orchids, which has enough nutrition, look at all that nutrition in there, okay, to get them to flower. Okay, it's very simple. Don't overcomplicate it. 
In terms of chochos and nunus and all those things, well, of course, we know that when you are feeling down, something's going to come and get you. Exhibit A is this poor guy here. There's mealybug on it, which is generally the most common. Yeah, mealybug. You see? Looks like cotton wool. Bit of fluffs of cotton wool. Folks, you can just wipe it off. Um, it does come back if you wipe it off because it kind of lingers around. It's generally mealybug and scale are the two. Their scale, um, they're like little white things and that can, on, the, on your larger shrubs like your figs and that, your ficus, they can actually get onto the main hardened stem and look like very, very little uh, tortoises. And you can actually scrape them off. Um, you can see here, you can actually scrape these off. But you've got to get rid of them and there are different ways of getting rid of them. Whether you're going to use something like just a general insecticide, which is a ready-to-use spray, all right? <clears throat> or you can use a systemic insecticide, which you would just sprinkle around, but it does take longer to work. Uh, so I would put the systemic around, and then as you're watering or feeding, so it's going in, and then it'll get taken up by the roots, or... And together with that, I would also spray, okay. But plants will tell you when they're unhappy because that's just what they do. They, they will tell you. They will most certainly tell you when they're unhappy. And you can see visually that they're unhappy. Um, but what joy do they bring? And without the downs, like in anything, we can't enjoy the ups of the relationship that we have with these things called plants. Uh, guys, remember to get out there and get your latest copy of The Gardener and Detainee. This is our fabulous June issue. Oh my goodness, and look at that. July, I beg your pardon. This is Elo, Elo. Look at them. Look at that. So if it's Elo's you after or the trendiest house plants, will you believe that we have five, six, seven pages of the trendiest house plants that you need, most of which have been discussed right here today. Even in more detail, guys, you find it right here. Get this at your local nursery, your local garden center, or your local shop where you go and get your groceries. And if you can't find it there, please just drop us a mail, send us a message on Facebook, and we'll tell you where you can get it. Um, and of course, grow to eat is out this is the winter edition is still on sale guys remember this is kale this is everything that you need to do it's got moon gardening it's got grow indigenous veg and many many more yummy yummy most delicious recipes so uh, you thought kale wasn't cool i'll tell you it's cool and it's also delicious so please get out there and grab your copy um the most awaited most wanted Thanks Plants for 2023 campaign starts again um, in August, guys. Remember, there's lots up for grabs. Um, what is the whole thing about? It's about us saying thank you to these beautiful plants that surround us. Um, it's all about that. And always, as always, there's something in it for you. And uh, I can't really let the cat out the bag, but... When you get your August issue of The Gardener or Detainee, and when you check out the Thanks Plants website or our social pages, you are going to want to be in it to win it. It's as simple as that. Um, and you're going to learn a whole lot more about why we should be thankful for certain plants. And for me, that's important. It's about being thankful. It's about being grateful. It's not being the moaning mini, it's being appreciative and absorbing the gratitude and all that positivity that is around us that we choose to let in rather than the negative stuff. And like I say, if you want clean air on top of that, just have nine sense of areas or mother-in-law's tongues in your home per 100 square meters. Guys, a huge thank you and shout out to Stark Airs. Um, thank you. And uh, all you've got to do is get the stuff to keep them alive. Don't overwater them. Talk to them nicely and 
stop threatening them with a broomstick. Guys, remember, there's loads more on our YouTube channel and, of course, in your favorite gardening magazines that have been contributed to by the best that South Africa and the world has to offer in terms of gardening advice. Um, I thank my amazing team that is behind me um, because without them, I am but nothing. To the team of the magazine, um, uh, you guys are rock stars. Anna and Wendy, your patience, uh, just the fact that you are always there. Um, God bless you and thank you uh, for everything that you do to put together these most amazing magazines of ours. And all that's left to say is it's a gardening weekend ahead. Dress warm, God bless you all, and happy gardening. The Gardener Masterclass was proudly brought to you by Stark Airs, the foremost African commercial and home gardening specialist of globally sold premium seed and innovative gardening solutions, growing together for a sustainable future. And the Gardener and Detainee magazines. Get access to the greatest gardening minds, latest gardening trends, inspirational ideas and tips. If gardening is your passion, digging in the soil is your pleasure, and growing your own food is your mission, we've got a lot in common. Get access to the greatest gardening minds, including yours truly, with The Gardener magazine. Filled with the latest gardening trends, inspirational ideas and tips. Available from leading retailers or online at thegardener.co.za. From cover to cover, it's gardening at its best.